Hello, everyone. Welcome. People are joining now. As you join, if you can type your name and affiliation in the chat and you can say hello that way. We're going to keep the chat active throughout this event so you can type in comments. We are going to be doing questions from the audience after and we'll use the Q&A tab that's at the bottom of your screen, but feel free to use the chat for comments to say hello, introduce yourself. It's good to see, see those uh, comments in there as well. So why don't we get started? I know people are still joining. I'm Kristen Daly. I'm the Executive Director of Global Washington. I'm really excited to co-host this event today with Eric Klender from the Final Mile Group. Eric and I have been doing this quite a, quite a, a number of years now. Um, even before COVID, we would do them in person. So it's great that we've kept it going uh, virtually. So I just wanted to set the stage for the discussion today. And as a reminder to everyone, um, talk about the earthquake in Haiti. So you all may recall that on August, 20, August 14th, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck Haiti and at least 2,248 people died. There were nearly 13,000 people injured and more than 650,000 people were in need of emergency humanitarian assistance. This was an absolutely devastating earthquake in a country that was already suffering from COVID and political turmoil. We're now seven weeks after the earthquake and I'm really glad we're doing this event today because so many times when a natural disaster leaves the headlines, people forget about it. So I'm glad that we are keeping this conversation going. Seven weeks after, there is a period when we move from emergency relief to recovery. However, even during that recovery, there are so, so many critical factors that these uh, three organizations are responding to. One thing just to think about in the recovery phase is that in Haiti, nearly 70% of all schools were actually destroyed or damaged during the earthquake. And it delayed the start of schools by over a month. And this means that over 230,000 children are at risk of dropping out. This is just an example of the, how a devastating earthquake can cause a rippling effect for many years to come. So again, I'm honored here to be here today with these three organizations who've been responding to the crisis. And I really look forward to hearing from them about what happened immediately after and today. So now I'll turn it over to Eric Klender that will introduce the speakers and tell you more about the program. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 20th quarterly final mile meeting. I hope everyone had a good summer. It's doing well and staying healthy. Uh, so uh, today's panel gets at the core of really what we ho ultimately hope to do with the final mile, and that's to build partnerships. Uh, that multiply the impact of what we could possibly accomplish individually. Uh, and to be clear here, a little nomenclature, because I heard someone this morning uh, confuse humility and humiliation. Uh, we're talking about organizational relationships that take one plus one and get three. We're not talking about partners. Like a buddy of mine said over the weekend, I told my partner that I'd switch the bed for a trampoline and she hit the roof. The, uh, we're talking about partnerships and partnerships are key to what we do because the challenges that we address demand the impact of resources that are only found with that completeness that a partnership can deliver. And that the Haiti earthquake is a great example. I'm, I'm personally proud that Lyndon was able to play a big role in the humanitarian response by flying charter rotations of our L-382 Hercules aircraft to Port-au-Prince, first from Miami and then from Fort Lauderdale, but we could not have been as successful as we were without our own partnerships on the ground in Haiti as the airport administration replaced its entire staff at the height of flight operations. And our Florida partners were able to come up with ground handling support and facilities in a super tight labor market that allowed us to, uh, to work, work the planes on the ground. So as the saying goes, teamwork makes the dream work. And in what we do, it's absolutely vital in, to impactful outcomes. 
Before we get started, I want to give a big thanks to our co-host, Global Washington, for all they do in the community, and particularly for what they've, for the support they've shown to this meeting. Uh, if you're not, if you or your organization are not members of Global Washington, please do check out their website, have a conversation with Kristen Pradima, and consider attending their annual conference in December. It's not to be missed, it's a great event. So we do four things at the final mile. One is we learn. Uh, today, we're gonna hear from a great panel from Amazon, AmeriCares, and Hope for Haiti on their partnership and response to the earthquake. We network. At the end of this program, we'll engage in a half hour of network breakout rooms to see old friends and meet new. We troubleshoot. Now, today we don't have any topic anonymously submitted, but if anyone has an issue they want to address at a future meeting, please just get in touch with me and we'll do that. And lastly, we have fun. In the past, we've had all these meetings in person in the evening, and it's literally hard to get everyone out of the room at the end of the event because the uh, atmosphere is, is so fun. Uh, we have breakout rooms now virtually, but there's always a chance to make someone smile with a fun story or a joke. So please do have fun with, with today. So uh, now let's get after it and meet our panel. First up is Abe Diaz. Abe is disaster relief lead at Amazon. He's principal technical product manager on the disaster relief team, or disaster on the disaster relief by Amazon team. He got to start working on payments and revenue automation for Prime Video. And in 2017, he had the chance to participate as a technical volunteer filling, plane, filling a plane with relief items for Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. Being able to mobilize the technology, people, and resources of Amazon for a cause like this was moving, a moving experience for Abe. So he decided to join the disaster relief team by Amazon permanently and is now in charge of corporate donations and mobile disaster pickup points. Born and raised in Puerto Rico, Abe holds a BS in computer engineering from UPR Mayaguez and an MS in information security from Lipscomb University. Welcome, Abe. Sorry. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> Go ahead and begin. I'm I'm gonna roll with the with everyone's introductions after as a, as you finish out. Okay. Well, I as as Eric mentioned, I lead disaster relief for Amazon. We participated in over sixty disasters in the past five years. Um, donated over forty million dollars for the product and you know over fourteen million items uh, across the globe. So whenever there's natural disasters, my team activates for for those and in large scale activations like the air or, um, you know, Dorian in 2019 or Maria or Irma in 2017, you know, we have massive activations that include hundreds of employees participating, filling multiple planes and getting those, those items where, where they need to go. So uh, my team is global in terms of scope, uh, but we work with local teams to execute. So across the globe, if it's India, if it's Europe, Germany, uh, Indonesia, Australia, it doesn't matter. Um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have the right teams to uh, deploy and help us, with, you know, get the right items to that location. And we have different approaches for different parts of the world. Some things work in some places, some things don't work in other places. Um, but we have a, an incredible network of nonprofit organizations and logistic, logistical partners um, like Linden, like Hope for Haiti, like AmeriCares that we work with to, to, to get the, the work done. So happy to be here. Did you want to? Did you want to discuss your um, how you uh, proactively brought uh, Amazon into the uh, response? Yeah. So for for Haiti specifically, right? Um, as soon as the earthquake happened, we we knew it was going to be um, similar magnitude to what happened in 2010. So we knew it was going to be a large scale sector. So we started reaching out to our partners and organizations that we worked with in the past, including the IFRC, including. Um, you know, I said the children, other organizations that we work with in the past, and um, started listening to what were going to be the, the needs on the ground. And it was very clear that it was a very different, you know, type of needs in the sense that not all of Haiti was impacted, right? So, um, so there were things that could be sourced locally. We had organizations that asked for help to source items locally, uh, but some of the other items, like for example, 
you know, what Americans is looking for is, you know, a lot of people got their arms broken, their legs broken. They needed things to immobilize those, you know, those those limbs. And uh, that type of medical equipment is is something that, you know, we have a large selection in Amazon of products that, that we can participate with. So we're happy we can extend that to those organizations. Uh, and then we're always looking and listening for who are the organizations that are um, highly local, um, but really credible. And, you know, Hope for Haiti was one of those that, you know, we heard the name once, we heard the name twice, and then by the third time, we said we need we need to you know reach out. So um, I was lucky enough that uh, I, I got to interact in a, in a common in LinkedIn <laughs> with with Meg, and, and and that was the beginning of the conversation. You know, after that, you know, I just basically asked, you know, what do you need? Um, there's 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 a level of of betting that goes behind the scenes, but but after that, you know, we're looking at organizations that have you know a great presence, great credibility grade uh, standing over the past few years, right? Um, and their connections and their um, just local knowledge is really critical in getting things in there. There were a lot of organizations that tried to get stuff into the country and were failing. Um, one of the benefits that we have is because we work with multiple organizations, we get all of those sit rep reports from them and understand like what's working, what's not working. We're able to share some of that information. So. Uh, we very quickly said, hey, you guys already have a, a, a route to get things into the country. You've been doing this for many years in the past, so we, we trust you. Um, and that was it. After that, we really worked on what, what were the high ROI items that were needed for, for Hope for Haiti, um, for example, that, that, could, that would provide a uh, you know, large impact to, to the population. So uh, as, as I'm sure you'll hear from some of the other panelists, you know, one of the things that happened was the earthquake really uh, caused a lot of damage on some of the wells that people used to uh, harvest water. Um, so what that means is that now all that water is lost, that needs to be repaired. And in the meantime, there was a, a strong need for um, water filters, for example. Uh, people who lost their roofs, they needed, you know, tarps. So like, that's the type of item that, that you know, we can come in and help uh, where it's needed. I'll move to my panelists. Thank you, Abe. Let me uh, let's let's move on, on to uh, to Kate Deshino. Kate is uh, Kate is vice president of emergency operations, emergency programs at AmeriCares, and oversees response and recovery programs in the United States and around the world. She's responsible for deploying emergency response teams, coordinating large scale deliveries of medicines and relief supplies and implementing recovery programs that restore the health services for disaster survivors. A leader in the emergency response field, Deshino serves on the Global Advisory Board of the Humanitarian Innovation Initiative at Brown University. Previously, she served on the Board of Directors of the National Volunteer Organizations Active in Disasters, where she was a member of the Executive Committee and Chairman of the Disaster Health Committee. Prior to joining AmeriCare, she served as an associate director of Save the Children's Domestic Emergencies Unit. She earned a master's degree in international administration from the University of Denver and a bachelor's degree in international studies in Spanish from Muhlenberg College. Welcome, Kate. Thanks so much, Eric, for the kind introduction. It is so great to join such an esteemed panel and discuss the power of partnerships, particularly in the context of the Haiti earthquake. Um, so I look forward to helping illustrate how partnerships come together to allow us to respond to ever increasing and complex disasters. So I think before we sort of get into some of the details, I'd love to start with some context um, so that folks can see that there is actually a lot of preparation um, and planning that goes into you know, where we are today in terms of these three great organizations working together in response. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about AmeriCares and, um, and who we are as an organization. So AmeriCares is a health-focused relief and development organization um, that's focused on saving lives and improving health for people affected by poverty and disaster. So every year, um, AmeriCares reaches about 90 countries, um, including the United States, with a range of life-changing health programs, as well as medicines, medical supplies, and emergency assistance. So we are uh, the leading global nonprofit provider of donated medicines, medical supplies, 
Um, and we distribute about $900 million of meds and supplies to an average of 90 countries annually. Um, so how do we do this? So basically, AmeriCares is the intermediary between a large network of healthcare partners and product donors. And so we have the opportunity every single day, um, even outside of the emergency space, to work with an expansive health center network um, where we work every single day with about 4,000 health center partners in the US and around the world. And Hope for Haiti is actually one of those incredible partners that we work with just every single day. And so when emergencies happen, um, we're able to actually build on top of those partners uh, partnerships that we have on an everyday basis. Um, and the same is true with our network of more than 200 pharmaceutical, medical supply, and medical device companies who entrust us with their product. And I'll say that Amazon is, again, one of those incredible partners that helps us you know, access the critical supplies that we need, and we're able to then respond quickly to disasters as they strike. Um, so I guess next, maybe I'll share a little bit about what AmeriCares does in response overall um, to continue to paint the context. Um, so every year um, we respond to about 30 disasters um, worldwide. Um, we respond quickly, um, but we also stay and work in the long term, focused on recovery projects as well as bringing preparedness programming and the idea of um, strengthening communities over the long term. Um, so to do this, um, we have a core team of experts, um, but we also have what we call our global roster, which is a network um, of about 600 trained and uh, ready emergency responders that range from healthcare professionals to response experts, including logisticians and others. And so um, in many cases, our relief workers are among the first to respond and um, stay for um, the duration needed to respond to disasters. So in the context of Haiti, um, I think it's important to share that AmeriCares has worked in Haiti since the 1980s. Um, so we have been supporting um, health centers and local organizations with donated medicines and medical supplies, um, both on an ongoing basis and in response to disasters. Um, so we respond to many disasters around the world and particularly in Haiti, um, we have a track record of responding to multiple disasters, um, which range from, you know, the 2010 earthquake in Port-au-Prince to Hurricane Matthew in 2016 and even most recently the COVID-19 pandemic. And so at the time of the earthquake, um, AmeriCares was already regularly providing support to um, a nearly 30 um, health facilities in Haiti. Um, and specifically in one community in Grand Anse, um, a rural community of Pastel, AmeriCares actually um, is and was the only health focused organization um, supporting a health facility that serviced a population of about 50,000 people. Um, so I think that's um, important context when, as Abe mentioned, working with organizations who, you know, know the local context and are able to um, operate within that context. Um, so um, maybe I'll just share um, that in any response um, that AmeriCares conducts, we have a, a couple key guiding principles. Um, and in the context of Haiti, I think two are really important to call out. One is um, information and the other is coordination. Um, so in the context of Haiti, um, AmeriCares had an ongoing presence in Haiti, um, a small but mighty team, um, as well as this network of partners. So we were able to hear both quickly and um, robustly on what was happening on the ground and what the needs were. Um, and in many cases, um, disasters are really dynamic. Um, and at times we can, you know, sort of talk about the fog of the disaster. So how things change really quickly and how important it is to have the right information at the right time um, to be able to respond. The second key component um, is really focused on coordination and the ability to think about the response on a number of different levels. And so we coordinate with national and local governments, um, as well as with our range of local partners, and then also making sure that we're operating um, in the humanitarian response infrastructure. So how we're able to look at that international um, uh, country level and then local context and making sure we're coordinating across those pieces. Um, and we're really what that does is, um, you know, helps us understand what everybody else is doing um, to avoid duplication of efforts and to address gaps. 
Um, so maybe just to dig in a little bit more um, in the context of the August 14th earthquake, um, we were very fortunate our, our staff were safe. Um, one of our doctors in Jeremy actually climbed out of a window as his house came just crashing down on top of him. Um, and like many other incredible frontline workers, he was back to work the next day. Um, and I'll say the, the day after the earthquake, um, we delivered one of our first shipments of supplies to one of our rural health centers. And that was actually in advance of Tropical Storm Grace. Um, and I share that because preceding the earthquake, you know, Haiti was really reeling from a, a number of compounding disasters. So facing mounting insecurity, you know, all the way through COVID-19 and, you know, even after the earthquake struck, Tropical Storm Grace just brought sort of one more complication um, to uh, the access to the area and uh, thinking about um, response interventions. So um, like many other um, organizations, we worked really quickly um, to engage our response teams. Um, our response um, has been twofold, um, really focused on providing critically needed medicines and medical supplies as well as reinforcing the local health system with staffing capacity, um, particularly mobile medical teams to be able to go out and provide critically needed care um, to survivors in affected communities. Um, I'll just talk really quickly about um, our, our two interventions, um, particularly access to medicine, because that's really what ties this group together um, and really elevates the idea of and power of partnerships. Um, so, uh, as I shared, we work very closely with local partners, including Hope for Haiti on an everyday basis. And so as needs are identified, we were in conversations every single day, every single hour almost, um, with the Hope for Haiti team and other partners really understanding what was needed. And so what we then do is take that information and match it against a pre-positioned product that we have in stock and also then work with many of our other product partners like Amazon to quickly secure what else is needed. Um, and then we build those shipments and send out um, uh, the, the shipments um, of meds and supplies to partners based on that need that was clearly identified. Um, so to date, we've sent out about nine shipments um, to a handful of partners, um, you know, again, one of those being the incredible Hope for Haiti, um, as well as other organizations working in, in the area. One of the key issues that we identified was actually um, uh, survivors having injuries that required higher level care um, that were needing to be referred to Port-au-Prince. And so in addition to working in um, the, the South, um, the more impacted areas, we were, act were also supporting health facilities who are serving as more of that referral pathway and providing that higher level of care. Um, so some of those critically needed um, medical supplies that Abe started talking about um, included those orthopedic supplies and first aid supplies. So in this context, thanks to Amazon and their support, we were able to include um, items like crutches and walkers, um, stretchers and splints and other first aid items on many of our shipments um, that went out the door. Um, and we know that many of these needs will continue over a period of time, um, particularly for products that are just at times not available in Haiti and are still needed to help with uh, continued response and recovery efforts. So more shipments in the works. Um, I'll just touch really quickly on uh, medical teams um, and some key components around them. Um, so AmeriCares um, has a track record for providing medical teams in response to disasters, and that does include Haiti as well, um, where uh, prior to the earthquake, we actually provided medical teams after Hurricane Matthew um, back in 2016. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, being connected um, on an ongoing basis and being a trusted partner within the health system allows us to really um, coordinate quickly. And we were actually asked by uh, the Ministry of Health in that community to be the lead health partner. And so really what we were able to do um, was coordinate um, all of these different moving pieces, um, identify, lo identi locally identify needs, um, and work with the ministry and other partners to, um, to actually launch five medical teams, which are working across the South, um, three particularly in Grand Anse and two in the South. Um, I'll share, you know, our medical teams are staffed 100% um, with Haitian medical professionals, um, many of whom are still part of our global roster and worked with us in the past. Um, and to date, our team has seen um, over 10,000 patients already. Um, 
I'll say to Abe's point, um, you know, the teams continue to treat earthquake related wounds and infections, um, uh, as well as sort of exacerbating chronic care conditions. Um, but most recently, we're seeing a, a lot of gastrointestinal issues. And, um, you know, that's uh, really attributed to challenges in accessing clean drinking water. Um, Maybe the last piece that I'll share um, is that I think one of the key components is that regardless of what we're doing, um, it's so important to continue to coordinate and share information. And so in many cases, um, it's critical that we're in local meetings um, as you know, as well as other convenings, um, we're participating, we're sharing what we're doing, as well as increasing awareness um, on what others are doing, what's needed, and really having those conversations um, to understand, you know, where the gaps are and where we can further partner. Um, and I'll just say, you know, just to wrap up, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that is continuously needed. Um, you know, I would say due to, you know, a continued sort of um, really dynamic and fluid situation, um, there's going to be needs that continue to develop. Um, I think, you know, it's really important um, from both a response perspective, but also from a partnership perspective, um, that there's that trust that's at the core of the relationship. Um, there's a lot of things that can be scaled uh, during responses, but trust is actually not one of those. Um, and so it's really important to not be exchanging business cards during the disaster, to have those partnerships established ahead of time, and then to have that really proactive bi-directional communication, um, even when it's tricky um, with communications um, and a lot of moving pieces and busy people, um, but that's really how partnerships grow and thrive and, and come together, at least it has for, you know, this group and in our experience. So probably lots more to share, but maybe Eric, I'll stop there and hand it back to you um, and look forward to, to hearing from Meg. Thank you very much, Kate. Great, great point. Great point. So next up is uh, Meg Louise, uh, Meg Jean in Louise. Meg is the Chief Impact Officer for Hope for Haiti, working across the program development and finance departments to drive strategic growth and maximize program impact. Meg's international development career began as a Peace Corps volunteer, working on teacher training and developing libraries in Lesotho. She earned her master's degree in international educational development from Columbia University's Teachers College, then worked for organizations on education, education programs, corporate outreach, and emergency fundraising. She joined Hope for Haiti in May 2014 to manage social media, lead donor and partner trips to Haiti, and report on impact to funders to help improve the quality of life for the Haitian people, particularly children. Meg is driven by Hope for Haiti's core values, especially accountability, collaboration, and hope, and believes there's always a pathway to a better life. Welcome, Meg. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. So, uh, just to give you a little background on Hope for Haiti, Hope for Haiti has been working uh, in, in southern Haiti for the past 32 years with the mission um, to improve the lives of the Haitian people, particularly children. Uh, we have four core program areas, education, healthcare, um, WASH, and economic development. Our education program partners with school communities in the Sud, Sudest, and NEEP departments of Haiti. Um, and we work with school communities and school leaders to provide financial support, um, teacher training, ed tech interventions, nutrition programs, um, and school gardens at the schools. Um, our healthcare program has three main pillars. We have a primary care clinic, we have community health, and we have access to medications program, our gift and kind program. Um, we operate a primary care facility in downtown Lakai, uh, where we treat uh, chronic illnesses. Um, we have a wound care clinic, we have a dental clinic. Um, our community health program works in our 24 partner communities, and we have um, programs at the school. We have a school-based public health program that uses community health workers to work with the students throughout the school year as well. Um, over the summer, they work with the families of the students. Um, we have mobile clinics where we go out to those communities to serve, um, bring our, our whole team out to serve uh, the communities. And then we also have a community, a children's nutrition program that works with babies six months to five years old and helps them um, get healthy and stay healthy through their fifth birthday. Um, our WASH program provides access to water and water filtration. So we do water access, could be water catchment systems, 
um, digging wells or other water interventions. And then water filtration, um, we work uh, providing households, communities, community centers, businesses with water filtration so that they can have clean water on site. Um, and lastly, our economic development program resources Haitian entrepreneurs with um, access to financing through grants and loans, um, training and business development and networking opportunities. Um, our, our team with right now we're at 113 team members in Haiti, um, all Haitian, um, many of them who live and work in the communities that um, we serve and they are doctors, nurses, program managers and others dedicated to um, improving their own country. Uh, so while we've responded to multiple disasters over the years, including the 2010 earthquake, um, the this I'm sorry, the 20 yeah 2010 earthquake, the 2021 earthquake, it hit us differently because um, it hit home. It impacted our staff's homes. It impacted our clinic. It impacted our um, our office, and it impacted the majority of our partners. So um, while we were able to quickly mobilize. Um, and you know, we had stockpiles of emergency kits and emergency medications um, stored. The magnitude of this earthquake meant that um, we, needed, we needed more than normal. And so to give you an example, um, at our clinic in a typical three month period, we might see four to 5,000, we might provide four to 5,000 consultations. Since the earthquake, which has been said seven weeks ago, we provided 13,594 consultations. Um, so the need for additional personnel, additional medications, funding to keep the lights on, all of those things really um, expanded. Um, another example, our mobile clinic team used to go out twice, twice a month to provide mobile clinics. We're now, we now have two full mobile clinic teams that go out four to five days a week, providing you know up to 10 mobile clinics per month, um, per week, I'm sorry. So uh, the need for extra doctors, nurses, but admin staff and drivers. Um, so all of that has really expanded in the last seven weeks. Um, and with that, one of the biggest things is the critical need for essential medications um, and other supplies as, as I mentioned, not just our site, but a lot of our healthcare providers were, um, were impacted. So places were shut down, ERs were shut down, um, primary caregivers were shut down. So we because we were able to respond quickly and mobilize we the influx of patients really grew um so a lot of the facilities are still um are still recovering um and this is already mentioned but you know in addition to the earthquake haiti is um still grieving the assassination of the president a few weeks ago um responding to the COVID 19 pandemic right before the earthquake a huge batch of um doses of moderna vaccinations came to the country and Haiti couldn't even catch their breath to begin to administer those doses. Um, we're experiencing civil unrest, gang violence, and chronic. There are also the chronic issues like poverty, lack of access to healthcare, lack of access to clean water, um, and and education. So, while there are many challenges um, at Hope for Haiti, and this was in my introduction, I truly live live and love these core values. Um, we believe in hope. And so again, all of these challenges, we still, for us, it's still, um, if it were easy, anyone would do it, right? And we always believe that there is hope in any situation. Um, and as well, collaboration. We believe that through partnerships with local leadership, so like our school partners, um, the Ministry of Health, um, all of the people that are those frontline workers are incredibly important, as well as with other like-minded organizations, um, we can accomplish so much more together than we could alone. Um, and so this is where really AmeriCares and Amazon came in at a critical time to help with our earthquake response. So as Kate mentioned, um, AmeriCares and Hope for Haiti have been partners for decades now. Um, they've donated millions of dollars in value of medications and medical supplies um, to Hope for Haiti over the years. So like Kate said, in the good times and the bad, um, they've helped us through multiple public health crises. So like cholera, chikungunya, COVID-19. Um, and as well for normal times, like, um, you know, the chronic illnesses are huge. So access to high blood pressure medications or diabetes medications, which aren't always available in Haiti. And that's one of the challenges that um, we're facing now, you know, the supply and demand or the unrest in Port-au-Prince means that the road to the South is closed. So deliveries can't be made. Um, so, you know, they've been a partner, an ongoing partner um, for decades and, 
Uh, we've actually worked with Amazon uh, for a few years now, but at an employee level, Amazon has incredible employees, many of them who are Haitian of Haitian descent, who are passionate about helping their country um, and giving back. And so we worked with an incredible um, employee at, at Amazon who's just helped us. And so that's kind of who Abe was mentioning, uh, you know, was talking about Hope for Haiti, um, you know, kind of climbing to Abe's department. And then at the same time, I saw a post, a great post about Amazon on LinkedIn, and I saw Abe. And so did some LinkedIn magic and connected with him. And now here we are today. Um, so we're really, um, you know, we're really grateful for that. And Amazon had relationships with um, organizations and that could find the other, the non-medical supplies that we needed. So like tarps, tents, uh, solar lights, water filtration. Those are also some of the, the critical non-medical supplies that um, were really hard to find in Haiti. You know, the tarps, the quality of tarps that we could find, the availability of tarps, um, the logistics of bringing the tarps from, you know, picking up 10 here, 10 there, the quantities needed. So um, Amazon really came in at a critical time for us to help us those those first weeks with our um, emergency response, getting those supplies out to people who needed them um, in the long run, you know, in that immediate in that immediate moment. Um, so partnerships are incredibly important, um, especially in times like this. And, you know, we're grateful for both Amazon and AmeriCares and, you know, the entire global Washington community for highlighting this work for, um, it's seven weeks out, obviously the news cycles have already gone on, but there is still a huge need and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but we truly believe that together we can, um, you know, we can really make a difference. So happy to be here today and talk more about Haiti and the earthquake. Fantastic, thank you, Meg, that was wonderful. The, uh, now we wanted to go into uh, some question and answers uh, period for the, for the panelists. And uh, I, I will start us off and uh, good segue um, there, Meg, with the, the, uh, the news cycle, because uh, I wanted, wanted to get your take on how how your organizations responded to that because we and Abe and I actually talked about this on the phone that it seemed like the news cycle moved away immediately because the earthquake happened on the 14th of August and on the 15th Kabul fell to the Taliban and that dominated it completely dominated the news cycle. It was, it was actually difficult to to find segments on Haiti um, just just past that. So I wondered if you if you all could speak and how you how you react to that and that if uh, if your if your funders and, and backers uh, kept steady uh, with it being out of the news cycle or if you had to do anything extraordinary to um, to overcome that that bad timing. So I'll just open it up to anyone who wants to speak to that. Eric, I'll jump in. I think that's a, a great point. And, you know, yes, um, you know, just after the earthquake struck, the news cycle um, was very focused on the devastating crisis in Afghanistan that just continued to develop. And so I think, you know, the news cycle, you know, really helps us stay focused on many issues and continues to update us. And so in, in, you know, the absence of that, um, as things fall out of the news cycle, sometimes the fundraising slows. Um, I think one of the things, um, you know, that we do many times is continue to, you know, put updates on our different platforms um, to make sure that folks are aware of what our organizations are doing. Um, I know we worked very closely with Hope for Haiti um, to continue to, to keep Haiti in the spotlight um, through press conferences, for example. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of different um, things we can do. I will say, you know, we respond to dozens of disasters each year, um, some of which never see headline news. Um, and one of the things um, that's really important for us is that as an organization, AmeriCares maintains what we call our worldwide disaster fund that allows us to respond to a range of different disasters or hidden disasters that are outside of the news cycle or don't get, you know, the deserving um, sort of visibility um, that that they deserve um, and really allows us to be flexible um, and allows us to continue to respond um, long after that new cycle is done. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that, I think what, what Kate is kind of alluding to for an organization like Hope for Haiti, one of the most important things when you're giving to 
a disaster, I think, or supporting disaster is really working with those local organizations like a Hope for Haiti on the ground or like an AmeriCares that has that track record. Because for Hope for Haiti, we have an incredible um, network of supporters and donors that are deeply committed, deeply passionate, and truly understand the realities and have been with Hope for Haiti for the past 30 years. And so, yes, while it, it is, you know, you know, getting the resources to do the work is always going to be um, something that we need to do. Um, by building up a network of of committed donors, you kind of have, you know, what AmeriCares maybe their global fund is, but having those donors that, that you can call on, that you can reach out to, or that are already reaching out to you is really important. And so I think that's one reason why it's it's really great to partner with local organizations that have that history, because um, a lot of times there are people in the network that are able to, um, to support you. Um, I also will say that the Haitian community, not just in Haiti, but the global Haitian community is incredible. And Haitians, diaspora, Haitian Americans, you know, Haitians living abroad, really, um, really kept it in the spotlight in their communities. And so if you are, you know, I, a lot of the, um, the news that I see and a lot of the people that I follow on the internet and social media um, are deeply committed uh, to, to supporting Haiti. Um, and so I think that amongst the Haitian community, it's not over. And uh, there are still a lot of people and a lot of organizations that are doing great work that are that are fundraising. So I know sometimes it's hard to, you know, if you're not connected to Haiti to break into that. But, you know, I think a panel like this or an organization like Global Washington is so important because you have the ability to network. And I think that was one thing, Eric, you said is about networking and meeting each other. It's just so important so that um, you're able to, you know, align resources, develop partnerships so that you can keep disasters like the earthquake um, you know, in the forefront of people's minds. And I, I can tell you that even though what might be happening in the news, right, it's like in the center stage, like makes it, we have a high volume of, you know, people from, from Haiti who are employees or, or families of employees. So um, the Southeast of the United States, for example, and the West Coast, the East Coast, you know, we had employees reaching out. They were, you know, we created an internal campaign um, for employees to participate in one, with monetary donations that they wanted through the Nevity uh, platform. Um, so we see that traffic going. So we understand that even though this might be happening in the news, we, we, our eyes are in the right direction. Fantastic. We do have a uh, question from the audience from uh, Julie Bennion of the Trade Commission uh, for the, uh, at the uh, Canadian consulate in Seattle. And she asks uh, of Abe, how is Amazon able to offer improved logistics to disaster areas? For example, is the advantage in the delivery or in the better matching of the supplies to those who need them? It depends. Um, we've done it all. Uh, in, in Haiti, for example, we had a partner that had a local vendor and had the items that they needed. It was easier for us to participate in, in such a way where we would stimulate the local economy and get those items locally. Um, when the items are not available, then we work with our partners to get them to that disaster area. When we are able to, we'll put our own assets in, in use for that. So we've done it in the past and we'll do it in the future. So we have relief flights for, you know, for Dorian or, 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 or previous hurricanes when we use Amazon Air and move the items there. So it, it really, there's no, there's no playbook, to be honest with you, in that sense. It's really what is needed, what the partners are requiring. And, there's there's a certain amount of of you know like critical mass and, and volume that that it's needed for like really really large activations and, and sometimes in some disasters we we don't have that in that case you know we'll work with with our normal you know partners that we work with for logistics to get the items there in those situations where we do have a large volume large spike in a very short amount of time that's where we'll say okay let's let's look at using our assets so it really depends but for us is using all of Amazon assets to the benefit of our community partners. So that means products, that means logistics, whatever is needed. Fantastic. And we have a, we have a question uh, from Mary O'Connor. Uh, it also kind of ties into something that, uh, one of the questions I had. And it, the, um, the, the previous earthquake in, in Haiti in 2010 focused a lot of the humanitarian community on uh, how do we how do we do this better? How do we how do we respond in in that seventy two hour time frame where we know that that if we can do that, it's going to save lives. So Mary asked, 
you know, what can we do to strengthen the supply chains uh, locally and source locally? But the um, but that ties in with how do you how do you see how how well this played out? Uh, and I know the pandemic you know creates a lot of setbacks and a lot of a lot of extra steps. But the um, how do you how did you see it play out in this response uh, towards seventy two hours? And uh, and what can we do uh, better in the future to get to that seventy two hour goal? And I'll open it up. So. Yeah, I, I agree. This this response was incredible because um, the Haitians within Haiti truly were the first responders. And so, you know, when in 2010, the Port-au-Prince is and was and still is the center of the country, um, because Lakai is in Grand Anse, you know, they're outside of the Port-au-Prince area. We were within 72 hours, we were contacted by, you know, tons of organizations and doctors and people within Haiti, Haitian doctors wanting to come down to support, you know, organizations, private businesses, private individuals in Port-au-Prince wanting to support and quickly respond. And so um, Hope for Haiti and AmeriCare is, is on this network too, but there are, you know, one lesson learned, this was actually after Hurricane Matthew and then the beginning of COVID, um, developing a sued network of healthcare responders. So when we were, and there already existed many, many networks, and we kind of piggyback over, we piggybacked after the, or on top of the Haiti Health Network um, is a network in all 10 departments that um, they work with healthcare providers that are private, public, government, you know, missionary, whoever they are, um, to bring everyone together to avoid duplications, um, better collaboration, sharing on purchases, sharing on gift and kind, sharing on trainings and clinical webinars for staff. So those networks were happening, you know, on, you know, day-to-day -day basis and ongoing basis. So when the earthquake hit for like that network, it was easy to just, we already had the emails. We already knew each other, you know, WhatsApp groups were already existing. So I do believe that the response was better this time around because of that coordination. Um, the, the first responders, like, so the first few days, the emergency responders, there exists, you know, many airlines and um, helicopter services that that's what they do throughout, you know, throughout the, the year is they respond to emergency medical needs in Haiti. So there was already those those networks that existed and they were able to really was, respond um, quickly and to meet those acute medical needs. Um, and specifically, you're asking about supply chain. So in terms of supply chain, there are still, I would say, a lot of challenges. Um, you know, you said you've been to Haiti many times, so you understand the reality of having one major road from Port-au-Prince to the south um, and then a road from, you know, Lakai to Jeremy that's dependent on a bridge that is um, not working right now. So how do supplies get out there? Um, not everyone has the resources to fl fly supplies. So I do think there needs to be um, some work done on the supply chain because there definitely is, you know, Haiti's an island, supply and demand, um, and just the reality of the infrastructure. You can't always things aren't always there, right? And so that's where I think partners like Amazon comes in, AmeriCares comes in, where they're able to provide those, those critical supplies and kind of fill the gap. Um, as an organization, Hope for Haiti, we first try to buy locally. And since the earthquake, we have um, done, you know, several hundreds of thousands of dollars of local purchases to buy things. It's still not enough. And so um, there, yeah, so I don't have a, I don't know if that's a solid answer, but I think there needs to be um, you know, you need to understand the reality and work around it, work with partners. And, um, you know, there can be some work to do to improve it, but it's definitely a, um, a complex intervention in order to, you know, when the next earthly comes, will we have enough supplies? Or is this something that there's always going to be a need? You know, Kate, you can answer that. Responding to multiple, multiple disasters, there's always going to be some need, but, um, what can we do to make sure that we're more prepared than we were at this time? Yeah, I, I think that's a great answer. answer. I, I think that's a great answer. And um, maybe I'll just build on what Meg said to say, I think one of the things, um, in my opinion, that's really changed um, since the 2010 earthquake and really has focused on speed and the level of care is the World Health Organization Emergency Medical Team Initiative. Um, and the EMT initiative was really designed um, to ensure that um, medical teams coming into a catastrophic, you know, disaster environment um, were coordinated and had um, the level of capabilities needed um, to be both self-sustaining 
um, and provide high quality care. And so um, there was a big body of work um, that's focused around, you know, the types of teams and the minimum standards, there's guiding principles, there's core standards, there's technical standards, um, there's a verification process um, for uh, teams that, you know, have this credential. Um, and really the key is that teams are coordinated in times of disaster. Um, so for example, I'll just give you a quick one. Um, so AmeriCares is uh, building the capability of a type one um, medical team, which is mobile. Um, so the goal is to provide outpatient care um, and uh, be able to treat at least 50 patients per day. Um, in, in many cases, it's more. Um, but really the goal is, um, to your point, Eric, is you would need to you know, have the capability to play within 72 hours, be completely self-sustained, um, be operational for at least two weeks, um, and really be coordinated within the local health system. So this is also an initiative building on Meg's point um, around being locally driven, is that these are requests coming from um, the country and they're coordinated at the country level. Um, and, you know, I think this is one of those big changes, um, you know, that's been really instrumental um, in the way that we're, you know, responding quickly at quality and has, you know, had a lot of impact um, since the 2010 earthquake. And to that point, the Ministry of Health did a really good job um, in the early days and weeks with identifying areas that needed support. Um, you know, that's when our mobile clinics began, they said, we worked with them and they assigned us the the organizations, um, you know, the locations and where to go. And so um, I think also that the strength of the the ministry has, you know, really helped with that response and having those those connections with the ministry is really important to make sure um, that things work smoothly. One of the things I can say is since we work with so many different partners and so many assessors across the globe, like it really boils down to the three pillars, which is the right selection, the right logistics and then the right local knowledge and execution, right? So on the local knowledge and execution, as everything Meg said, it's, it's working with local ministries of health, same thing happened in India, working with the people who are executing, who've done this before, doing all the pre-work, like Kate said, of like, what are the standards that who needs, what are, you know, what are the things that are, are needed? And then on the execution after the disaster, you know, for, for us really 2021 is one of those years where we move from reactive to proactive. We started our own pre-positioning um, hub in, in Atlanta and said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna start, you know, gathering the stuff and getting it ready before we even need it, right? So, so it's one of the first things that you can do to move from, you know, reactive to proactive. And, and also is when I look at requests from organizations, you know, I can clearly see who has experience and done this before just by the items that are being requested. When I get a request for, you know, bottles of water for an island like Haiti, I, I, I get a little antsy, right? Um, when I look at requests for like water filters, I go, okay, like this is, this is a much better investment. Um, you know, less waste, it's not a one-time use item. It's gonna have months and months of reuse uh, and it's really needed for that type of situation. So, so like I said, the right selection, the right logistics and the right know-how is what helps us get, you know, faster than 72 hours. Fantastic. So the, um, we, have, we have three minutes left, so I, I wanted to wrap up and, and, uh, and uh, just say that in my experience, every time there's a, a disaster response, whether it's a, whether it's a health emergency or, or a natural disaster, there's always, I, I've never seen a time where where someone didn't realize afterwards or during that, hey, I never knew this organization existed. So that's why, that's why it's so important that we do these type of events and kind of connect and know who, who, who does what and, and to come together as a community more often. Uh, because even, even when Lyndon, when we did our Ebola response in, uh, to West Africa in 2014, we were, we were working right alongside a company called McFadden, an American company called McFadden that had a thousand people in Liberia that we could have, we could have definitely helped each other in, um, you know, in, in logistics and, and people on the ground support and didn't know, we didn't know what, what each other were doing until, until afterwards. And uh, had, that, had that connection been made uh, in the in prior to the response, it would have been it would have been a stronger response. I'm I'm positive of it. So the um, so it's it's super important that we do this, 
And uh, and I want to uh, thank our thank our great panelists. Um, fantastic information. Great uh, great food for thought as far as uh, what you did beforehand and how you how you built how you uh, run on that trust and um, and, and cooperate uh, to the fullest like like you have. That's a it's a great example of partnerships and um, and something that we should be doing in the final mile and, and, and everything we do. So thank you very much. And uh, so following this, we're gonna be going into breakout rooms uh, if, if you can attend uh, to, um, uh, to, to network. And uh, so, for the, uh, so for the first breakout room, the, uh, the icebreaker will be uh, a favorite book or a favorite show that you've watched uh, during the pandemic. So uh, with that, I want to thank the uh, thank the group again, and um, and thank the everyone who's attended, and uh, and thank Global Washington, and hope to see you on the other side. So um, the it's a link in the chat. There it is. Okay, so the link is is posted in the chat. You should have gotten also a another email from uh, from Zoom. Uh, that had a, a separate link, but you can use that uh, that link that's in the chat right now. So with that, have a great rest of the day. If you're if you're not attending, if you are, I will see you in a few minutes. Thank you.